Welcome to Overwatch. This time I'll be talking about my impressions after returning home from BlizzCon 2015. Now as you might be able to tell from my voice I am a little bit tired, but I just wanted to get my thoughts and feelings on the what I saw out there out as soon as I could. First of all we're going to cover the three heroes, after that I'll talk a little bit about the new map, Hollywood. After that I'll talk about the payment model and the additional stuff around that that they released information on. After that we'll talk about the story stuff that they did, I was at that panel and it was great. And after that I'll talk about the interview I had very briefly with Jeremy Craig, one of the senior game designers. And after that I will finish up by talking about my general feel of the event and some of the conversations I had with the developers there. I just want to throw out a massive thank you for Blizzard for bringing me out there. I had a, an amazing time and gained a ton of insight on the stuff that's going on in the game as well as their approach to the game going into the future. So first of all, let's talk about the three new heroes, and I want to start with May, because May, in my opinion, and the opinion of a few of the more and a few of the more experienced players there, is that she's definitely the most impactful of the three new heroes that they have added. May sets up kills like no other hero can. Her core strength is in her ability to make other people do more damage, be more effective, and she is just a complete terror on the battlefield. This is not a face of mercy, she is a stone cold killer, literally, and she will just freeze you to death and then shoot an icicle through your brain without thinking about it. Not only that, she will completely set you up for a Farah hit, for Widowmaker hits, for any kind of damage that you can expect. She is incredibly, incredibly strong as she is right now, and I look forward to seeing her in a lot of games. The key thing with Mei, to me, is that she forces you to make a decision, an important decision at that. She forces you to choose between killing the person who's going to annihilate you, or killing Mei who is enabling the person who's going to annihilate you. And in a lot of cases, picking the Mei is a fairly poor choice, but you've got to deal with her somehow before she freezes you to death. And the reason why she's hard to deal with is because she has a lot of get out mechanics. She can heal up in her ice block and she can remain immune while that, while the damage dealer just does a lot of hurt on you while you try and take her out or wait for her patiently to leave the ice block. She can throw up a wall, make it hard to get to her and make it hard to finish her off as well. So she can also just ice block and then wall immediately afterwards, some people finding that incredibly effective as a way of disengaging reliably with Mei. Her ultimate is incredibly strong on taking points and taking the payload. It's very useful for just clearing out an area, setting things up very nicely for a Zarya to come in and just pull everyone in, for fire to fire off her ultimate, for everyone just to do a huge amount of damage. She's an enabler and she's a very good one at that and I look forward to seeing her in a lot of games. Playing multiple Mays, however is not a strong strategy, you just want one, I'd say two is probably pushing it. And you just want the one simply because when you start having more your team loses a lot of damage. I went up against a team of four Mays and that did not end well for them when I went Farah and just started killing everyone. Turns out having a close range spray and a hard to use projectile doesn't make for easy sniping out of the air. Next up I want to talk about D.Va. D.Va, a lot of people are underestimating in my opinion. D.Va is an interesting hero from a design point of view because she fills in a gap between Reinhardt and Winston. Her ability to get around the map and launch into places that are fairly unexpected for a tank to appear in is very reminiscent of Winston's mobility. She's a little bit slower at it, but she can deal a lot of damage when she gets in close. She's fairly reliably durable, but she lacks that instant health, that instant recovery that most of the other tanks have. Every other tank can just slam in a few extra hit points, get that instant regeneration up and running, so you can throw down a shield, you can put up a barrier, do all that kind of stuff, you can heal yourself as Roadhog. D.Va can't do that, she can only use her anti-projectile mechanic, and that is strong, but it means you aren't fighting anymore, you have to choose between using that and dealing damage, and it only lasts a short period of time. Now the thing with D.Va is, when she's out of her mech, then she's not dead, you don't kill her, you have to actually hunt down the pilot and finish her off, and that is a little bit tricky to do. She can deal a surprising amount of damage with her pistol, it's about the same as Mercy's pistol, if you're curious. And hunting down and doing that phase of fighting against her is actually incredibly interesting. And it's a pretty cool mechanic in my opinion because it means that she doesn't have to have that incredible durability that the other tanks have. She, you can burn her down but you will not finish her off easily unless you can pin her and sort of trap her out of position and then get the killing blow. If you do leave her, when she's out of her mech for those who aren't aware, her ultimate does charge up very quickly and it will actually recharge passively slowly as well, so even if you aren't fighting, you're still ticking up slowly to get a new fresh mech. 
One interesting thing I did start seeing players doing, and some of the devs doing for example, is using her ultimate to get a new mech. So when your health drops low, you fire off the ultimate, set the enemy team up the bomb, run away and then call in a new mech after your old one is detonated, get the new fresh mech, 500 hit points, all good to go and ready to fight. Her anti-projectile ability is incredibly interesting simply because it's not limited by damage like most barriers are, it's limited by time. This means she can push very reliably into Bastion, it means she's very good against Widowmaker, she can tank an entire Farah ult without batting an eyelid, unlike Reinhardt where the barrier will go down and I believe Farah if she lands every rocket will kill Reinhardt as well. As such, D.Va is in an interesting space. I did go up against the Yogg's cast who were playing a game of five D.Vas and a Lucio and I did actually manage to make a lot of headway against that by simply playing Zarya and had a lot of fun doing that simply because D.Va cannot block Zarya's beam and I had fun running around chanting in a heavy Russian accent, come here little girl, let me cut you out of your tin can. Finally, last but not least, is Genji, probably the hero that most people were excited for, and he's a blast to play, but he is very tricky. You've got to be in the mindset of using those shuriken, they're very accurate, they deal a high amount of damage, use them to set people up for the kills, then you dash in and get the kill and get the reset on the dash, and you can use that to disengage or continue engaging, and hopefully get more resets and generate power from there. If you just try and dash in willy-nilly, you're going to end up in a situation I ended up a lot in, where you dash in and then just die. While the reflect does give you some tankiness, and it is immensely satisfying, You've got to keep in mind that it only lasts a short period of time and it is by no means immortality. For example, there's an interesting middle ground against the battle against Farah as Genji, where you can bounce back her rockets if she's shooting them directly at you, but if she's shooting next to you or hitting walls around you, you can't reflect the splash damage, and so you will actually get picked off. And this applies for A, very bad Farahs who can't land the direct hits, and B, very good Farahs who actually know what they're doing and will aim around you and deal damage indirectly to you. In terms of sheer influence potential, again I want to reiterate that Mei is probably going to have the highest impact on the game, but the other two heroes are an immense blast to play. D.Va looks intimidating, her ultimate is incredibly scary and I do wish it said nuclear launch detected when she fired it off, but people will learn to counter it in time. It's very much one of those things that it just forces you to disengage, it forces you to move. It's very similar to Hanzo's ult, in that at first it looks very scary and deals a huge amount of damage, but when you realize how to beat it, most people will get out of the way of it in time. It's incredibly good for clearing space, it's incredibly fun to drop it on people and just fire off the shift, her rocket boosters, and launch it as a bomb at people. I liken it to putting a brick on the accelerator and letting the car crash into the enemy team. It's immense fun to do, and when you land that multi-kill, it's hugely satisfying. She's a very fun hero to play. I don't think that any of them really strike me as underpowered or overpowered. I'd say that Mei might be a little bit overpowered, but we'll see. Genji also seems to have a huge potential to be overpowered, but we'll see how that goes as well. I do believe the developers I spoke to said that he was a little bit toned down in the actual build that's going to come to the beta relatively soon. The estimate I was given for that is about a week away. As soon as they can, they will get it up and running. Let's talk about the new map, Hollywood. It's pro it's very quickly becoming my favourite map. I managed to play on it a number of times as I literally spent most of my BlizzCon in the press room upstairs playing Overwatch over and over and over again, so I did get a lot of good games on that map. And it definitely reminds me a lot of King's Row and a lot of Numbani, which are, to me, two of the better maps. There's a lot of outdoor spaces, a lot of open areas for you to run around in, but there's also a lot of enclosed spaces, so if you're playing McCree and Reaper, you can find places where your character is strong, and if you're clever, use that pathing to get into good areas for your character, fight to your advantages, and play around that. A lot of good pathways around the map, lots of good places for Tracer to go through, lots of good places for Widowmaker to set up. It's a very fun map, huge amount of easter eggs and cool things in there as well to look out for. Super happy with that map, and look forward to learning about it more. Hopefully it stands up in the beta when we get to play it over and over again, but to me it looks like definitely one of the better maps around. So after the brief thoughts on the in-game stuff, let's talk about some of the stuff around the game that was announced. First and foremost, let's address the payment model. Now luckily I missed out on most of the Reddit drama. I heard that the subreddit was on fire when this stuff leaked, and the flames are still raging. And I say calm down. To me, the idea of paying up front for this game is fair enough. You, we knew from the outset that they could not have a payment model where you had to pay for heroes, and the developers announced this as being true before BlizzCon even began, so we knew they were not going to charge us for heroes. 
We know that they're focused on having the 21 heroes in the current map pool for now. That is what we're going to get, and that's what you get with your $40 price purchase. $40, it isn't a full price game. If you want the Origins Edition, then you can get that $60 price point. And if you're like me and want the Collector's Edition, then you're going to be paying for the nose for it. But it comes with a lot of cool stuff, so I'm kind of happy paying for that. Otherwise, to me, this was kind of an inevitability, and I do hope sincerely that as they have charged up front for it, the cosmetics and the resulting cosmetics are fairly cheap. I do hope that while they have amazing quality cosmetics in Heroes of the Storm, for example, the price for them is a little bit intimidating. Hopefully for Overwatch, because you've paid that upfront purchase, you're not going to feel ripped off when they start charging, you know, five bucks for a Widowmaker skin that is high quality and looks great, rather than the ten bucks or even higher that you end up paying in Heroes of the Storm. Otherwise, one other thing I want to comment on with this payment model is that when you buy a Blizzard game, you know that they're going to be supporting it for years to come. Now, sure, they're probably going to have expansion packs, that's how I imagine if they want to expand the roster, they will, by doing a paid expansion pack that might not be full price. I hope it isn't. And we'll see how that turns out in the future and how they want to introduce that. As far as I'm aware, they have no plans, and they definitely haven't said anything regarding the plans in the future for that. But you know that they're going to be looking after this game for years to come. This isn't like buying the latest Call of Duty that's going to get abandoned in a year's time when the next version comes out and you're not paying full price for that. I'm aware that there is kind of a phobia for buying multiplayer only games at a full price or semi full price price point. But at least it's not got a token three hour campaign that no one really gives a shit about and is going to be abandoned in six months anyway. So at least with Overwatch you have the guarantee that the Blizzard developer team are going to stay working on the game, keep polishing it, maybe keep adding new things to it, maybe just bundle that into the game as a whole. Personally, I think it's a fine model, it doesn't surprise me at all, but what I would have liked as a consumer to have that, you know, free to play and just sells cosmetics. I'm kind of sort of glad that they didn't go that pathway because that just encourages them to spam out as many cosmetics as they can so that everyone buys them. Dota 2 to me is very inundated with a huge amount of cosmetics you can buy. CSGO is kind of similar where you just have so many things that you can buy that it feels like you're constantly being pressured and spammed into buying these things and it kind of gets on my nerves. So I hope there's a focus on having high quality microtransactions rather than a huge breadth of them as well as having them at a reasonable price point because you have paid that upfront payment. And one thing I missed on the table of contents, funnily enough, is Overwatch on consoles. Now for me this is not an issue or not something I really think about. I don't think it's eating into the market share of the PC player base for example. I think people who want to play it on the PC will play it on PC. And I think the amount of people who think, oh well I'll buy it on a console instead, are very few and far between. I imagine the game runs fairly well on consoles, they've said they've been designing it like this from the start, and a few people kind of twigged onto that and some of the aspects of the design. And I even remember a lot of early complaints that, hey, this game looks like it's also being designed for consoles, and that was something that was used to sort of beat against the game. How well it will run, I don't know. How the esports scene on consoles will work out, I don't know. I can't imagine people will want to watch the PlayStation and Xbox versions of the game when you can watch a PC version of the game. You know, PC is just faster, quicker, you've got better aiming, it's higher skill capped. It's going to be a more dominant presence in the esports scene. That said, I imagine Blizzard's just going to wait and see and let it all run itself out. Otherwise, if you've got a console and you're interested in Overwatch, hey, congratulations. You know, you've got another option. I don't think this is actually going to detract from the game in any way. I think that the versions will run side by side. I did actually ask in an interview uh, how are you going to manage balancing for PC and for consoles? Is it possible that they'll split? Is it possible that they'll stay together? Of course I got the token answer that you know they'd like to keep them very similar but they are keeping an eye on it. And that to me is going to be interesting to see going forward. Hopefully we won't see nerfs say on the PC version because someone on the consoles is struggling against something that isn't happening on the PC version because we can do things a bit faster. And the final concern I have actually is getting a bit deeper into it, the way that you release patches and content onto consoles is you actually have to pay a fee every time you release a patch and do a distribution through their networks you have to pay a fee to either PlayStation or well to Sony or Microsoft and to get that going it means that Blizzard can't just release patches as they want or can't release stuff into the game as they desire it means that they're going to have to schedule it and manage to get those releases out in a 
reasonable fashion where they're not going to break the bank just to release a patch update. So that is one concern I also have regarding console involvement. Otherwise, let's talk about the story stuff. I was at the story panel and I loved every second of it. Hearing Chris Metzen talk is, he builds hype, he knows his way around hype, and he definitely got everyone excited in that room. For those of you who don't know, they've announced that they are going to be telling the story of Overwatch and the story surrounding Overwatch in comic book shorts and animated shorts, and I am super happy that they're doing this for two reasons. One, Overwatch very much favours those animated shorts. You don't want to have this long, sort of episodic kind of thing telling a very linear narrative. You want that episodic feeling, you want that you know, quick in and out little flashpoints of each character's interactions with each other and what they're doing, telling little self-contained stories and maybe building up a world as a whole around it, but not telling an episodic A goes to B goes to C goes to D. I'm very much looking forward to seeing what they produce with that and the teaser that they have is top notch. It looks really good and I can't wait to see more. The comic book stuff also has me excited, they're doing, going to be doing some of the backstory and graphic novels and then going to be telling more recent stories from what I could tell in the comic book format. Pretty goddamn cool stuff, I look forward to seeing it, I can't wait to read it and especially as they announce that all this stuff is going to be free on their site. So it's just going to be building hype and this is the kind of stuff that paying $40 for the game pays for guys. So I'm that's also part of why I'm fine paying that money. Next up, I had a brief interview with Jeremy Craig, who's one of the senior game designers at BlizzCon. He's one of the senior game designers for Overwatch, and I was in there with two other guys, and we asked a number of questions. For me, it was much less of a formal thing, I just wanted to sort of address a few things, get some clarification on a number of issues that I find interesting, and I was pleasantly surprised to find that he's one of the masterminds behind the UI in the game and especially stuff like the scoreboard and the kill feed or lack thereof and we got to talk a little bit about that with him. He was very eager to talk about the scoreboard and his ideas behind that, for example moving away from a focus on KDA, so A, it's harder to blame someone for losing when it's, you know, when they just have a lower score and B, it's hard for characters like Symmetra, for example, to build up a high KDA. You will get a few assists, but for her a lot of her power seems fairly hidden uh, especially in those shields, for example. She's never going to be topping the scoreboard, but has a huge profound effect from the statistics that they showed us. She has the highest win chance in the game, which doesn't surprise me too much, to be honest, as she has a lot of hidden power in the shields that she can give everyone. As a result, you know, people want to focus on their own performance and you get a good feel from that by seeing if you're first, second or third. You can also see your own improvements and lack thereof, for example, at the end of the game. You can see how you did in relation to the team as a whole, but not in relation to specific people. The kill feed thing was interesting, we only talked briefly about it, so for example I raised my concern that I would like to be able to know quickly if you know my friend has chased down a tracer, if they've killed that tracer, or if they haven't. His response was that A, they don't want to have a cluttered UI, so some of the feedback they got is that the UI seems very cluttered, or they want to have elements that they can remove from the UI. While some people feel that the UI needs more things in it, or it needs a Heroes of the Storm, like like a tracker for heroes that are alive or dead. My own personal feeling is that I think the game would benefit from a kill feed, but he was he's eager to listen and hear what people say. His response was that they haven't heard as much outcry as they were expecting for a kill feed, and that having the lack of kill feed A just rewards people for having good communication and being able to, you know, quickly tell you, hey, this guy's dead, this guy's down, this guy's down, let's go. I also managed to ask him about respawns and whether they were thinking about going to a traditional wave-based respawn or whether they are happy with how it is now, for example. And his answer was very interesting to me because he basically elaborated that what the timer respawn lets you do is it lets the kill cam play out so it very clearly shows you, hey, this is what happened, maybe you can fix this, that and the other, you can gain some information as well from that kill cam. And it also gives more merit to people like Lucio and people like Symmetra who can give you that teleporter to get you back in the action quickly instead of having you die and then suddenly you respawn five seconds later and you're back in the fray that much faster. You always have that same wait time so having the Symmetra and having the Lucio adds a lot of power to the team. Aside from that I managed to host a mini panel at the community area with my good friend Tactical Koala and we had a good time talking with two developers there and had a real blast just talking about play, counterplay with those guys. I want to thank everyone who managed to come out there. It was great seeing a good number of people out there just to sit around, talk with the developers about, you know, how do I deal with this, how do I deal with that in the game. We had some good discussion going on, getting the developers' insights as well into how the meta is being shaped right now, getting their opinions and thoughts on things. 
So I just want to give a massive thank you for those of you who came out, and I do hope you enjoyed that little mini panel with us. And otherwise, just a general feel for the event, because I was in the press room, most of the people up there doing the sort of the management and sorting out the queues were developers. And it was really good talking to all of those guys, getting to chat with them, their thoughts about where the game is, listening to my feedback where the game is, getting their thoughts on my feedback, for example, and hearing what they had to say about the state of the game. I managed to talk to sound designers, artists, game designers, systems designers, all these different kinds of people, and the one feeling I got was that they just want to make a great game. This is something that I've said time and again, but these developers are really passionate about the game. All of them care incredibly deeply about the characters, about the world, about making it feel good, making it look good, making it feel polished, and just having a blast with the game. Not one of them did I feel like was just there just to, you know, show face or just be there to collect a paycheck. They were all super eager to listen to you talk and listen to you describe, you know, oh, I found this frustrating, I found that frustrating. Give their own opinions on that as well and give a little back and forth on that and why maybe something is like this and something is like that. But, you know, they'll definitely check this out. And I was also pleasantly surprised in how many of them knew who I was, which was kind of, you know, nice for my ego. Otherwise, I will be doing more specific, focused content on the three new heroes fairly soon, going into them a little bit more in detail, especially once they hit the beta. I want to very quickly get some content on, out on those, as I'm seeing rumblings of people thinking that Diva's underpowered, and I don't quite think so. I think that she is actually fairly in a fairly good place from what I could tell, especially with the fact that she's so damn difficult to kill and actually finish off. You can get her out of the mech, but you can't kill her easily and that's intensely fun. I've got to also say that the personality of all three of the new characters is just top notch. I especially love all the touches on D.Va's mech. For example, she has sponsors like APM.TV or Fighting, which is something that you say in Korean esports. And it's just awesome to see all those little touches in their design and development. Otherwise, this has been a relatively short video as I blitz through my opinions on various things I saw at BlizzCon. I had a hugely good, amazing time there. I was so happy to meet a few people, shake a few hands, get to know a few people, also fanboy out over certain people like Jesse Cox, for example, who is a totally chill guy. Super happy to see he, him there and have a brief chat with him. And yeah, that's about it. Feel free to ask questions in the comments. I'll try and answer what I can. I will have more focus content out relatively soon, but right now I am going to probably sleep the sleep of the damned for about 20 hours and sleep off this plane ride. Thank you for watching to the end, I have been one amongst many. Toodles.